I truly do believe that the key to experiencing more of what God has for you is prayer. And I, I do believe that God is redigging the wells in the church, and we're going to move into a time of deeper things. How many of you in this place, you say, I want God to move in my prayer life? God's going to touch your life. He really is. And, but I want to talk to you on the four realms of prayer. And this message, when I say realms, I'm not talking different dimensions and moving to different worlds. I'm talking about four realities of prayer. And when you understand these four realms, you understand that categorically speaking, all prayer will find itself under one of these four. Now, there are many different facets of prayer. There's praying in tongues. There's praying in your mind. There is praying privately. There is praying corporately. But everything, no matter what it is, can fall categorically speaking under these four. And if you can understand these four as they pertain to all of prayer, I believe you can receive breakthrough in your prayer life. I believe you're going to hear the voice of God more clearly. You know, we've kind of accepted, just in the church world, there's this idea that the voice of God is not to be heard with clarity. And I know we know, if I say, how many believe you can hear the voice of God, I get a resounding amen, right? But the truth is that most people, most believers, when they talk about the voice of God, they talk about it in a way that's unclear. I'm still trying. I'm still working. I'm still waiting to hear God. And we've accepted that it's difficult to hear God. But you can hear the voice of God with such clarity that when he whispers in the spirit, you can hear him. You can hear the, the voice of God with such confidence that when he speaks, everything within you says, I know that's him. This is God speaking to me. And you move on it by faith. And I'm talking about this kind of prayer life that can cultivate the voice of God. So the four different realms of prayer, I'm going to list them. I'm going to go through them here. The first realm we're going to talk about is requesting. This is the prayer request. The second one we're going to be talking about is reverencing, which is worship. And worship is an aspect of prayer because it's communication with God. The third one is resisting, which is spiritual warfare. And the fourth one, it doesn't sound as mysterious, but it is very much as much prayer is, and that is reading. You read the word, it's prayer. And as you pray this way, as you enter into the deeper realms of the Spirit through prayer, what's going to happen is you're going to hear the voice of God more clearly. The power of God is going to intensify on your life. Your witness, your evangelism is going to transform. Why? Because it's Holy Spirit in power. Powered prayer. When I first began to seek the Lord, as some of you may have heard in the interview, I don't know how, uh, how many of you watched that episode, but if you haven't, check that out with, with Sid Roth on the It's Supernatural episode. In that episode, I talked about this season in my life that was a very different season for me, and it's a well that I still dig from today. In that season, I began to seek the face of God. And I'm telling you, as an 11-year-old kid who just received Jesus, I was passionate, I was fascinated with the person of Jesus. And I said, Lord, everything in me has to know the depths and the riches that is Christ. And so I gave my all, my heart, my being to seek his face. And we talked about this experience I had where I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, where I had experienced something that was that something more that many believers look for. But I had made an ultimatum with God. So I go in my room. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, that when you pray, you go away quietly, close the door. Why? Number one, it's so that there's no distraction. Number two, it's so that God can reward you publicly for what you do privately. There's something in what's hidden and what's exposed and what has power and what doesn't. And so what God did for me in that season of my life was found at a moment where I said, Lord, I'm not leaving this room until you touch me. I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit when I started talking. How many, when I started talking about that, I, I sense his, his presence here. And I said, Lord Jesus, you know why? Because when I talk about it, you say, I want that. And when you say you want that, that desire draws him closer because that desire is a form of worship. And so I, I was in the room and I shut the door and I said, I'm not leaving Jesus until you touch my life, until something happens. And I remember I had I, my fan in my room was on because it got very warm in that room. My fan was on. My Bible was open. My light was on so I can read the Bible. And I had music playing in the background, soft worship music. And so I had set the atmosphere and I was ready to do everything that I knew to do to seek the face of God. So I go in and I start praying. And I remember I got going and I was excited. I was filled with zeal. And I had made that ultimatum very clear. Lord, I'm not leaving until you touch me. And so I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying. And one hour goes by, 
and nothing happened. How many know when you're digging a well, every shovelful is dirt until you hit water? <laughs> and so I'm digging and I'm saying, Lord, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And that first hour was so discouraging to me because often I would do that. I would say, Lord, I'm going to pray for one hour. I would pray. I felt like heaven had invaded my life. And I would look up and maybe at the clock, 10 minutes had gone by. And how many of you experienced that? It's because that's the, that's, that's the flesh. It's, it's what I was doing was in the flesh. I was putting forth my effort. So the second hour goes by. I said, okay, I'm going to reach for the more melancholy aspects of my emotion. And I'm going to cry. I'm going to weep. I'm going to seek him. And what we do here, you see, it's we try to guilt God into a response. <laughs> Lord, don't you hear me? Don't you see me? Don't you love me? We, that one's, we, Lord, don't you love me? Can't you hear me? And we say it because we're trying to manipulate him in a way that he can't be manipulated. He doesn't respond to that. You know, when I get a phone call on my cell phone and the call starts going bad, I'll often tell the person on the other line, I'll say, listen, you're, you're not coming in clear. The call is breaking up. And what do they start doing? Most of the time they start yelling so that I can hear them. I said, no, no, the problem is not the volume. It's the connection. <laughs> when you're praying, we try to exude emotion. We exert our effort. With emotion, you're raising the volume. The volume is not the issue. It's the connection. And so that second hour had gone by where I'm praying that way. And guess what happened? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> then I reached for the more aggressive, the more, the more, the more spiritual. I had read books on spiritual warfare. I, I mean, I'm telling you, if there was an adjective, I took that adjective, attached it to a demon and rebuked it. The spirit of this, the spirit of that. The spirit of this goes, the spirit of that goes, and I'm praying against all of the things I could think of praying against. I'm going back to when I was five. Lord, if there was anything that was five years old blocking me, I'm doing the generational deliverance, all of these different things that I knew to do, and I had got aggressive, and I got angry, and I said, I'm not going to be, you know, subdued. I'm not going to be held back in the name of Jesus, and it's good to pray like that when it's spirit-led, but I initiated it. Wow. So finally... That third hour goes by, and nothing happened. And now, I'll be honest with you, I started to regret my ultimatum. <laughs> the fourth hour comes, and then I got intellectual. I got theological. I start, well, maybe analyzing and assessing, and I applied the frailty of human wisdom. I said, perhaps that will get, I'll tell you this right now. If it were possible to enter the presence of God by emotion or human effort, in that moment, I would have entered. But it's not. And I remember in that moment, I looked at the clock and I realized how much time had gone by. And I just started to weep. And tears were coming down my face. And I said, Jesus, I don't know how to pray. Jesus, I don't know what to do. You see, there's no man or woman on earth, no matter how anointed they are, who knows the way into the presence of God. Only the Holy Spirit knows the way in. And so I said, Lord, what do I do? I mean, I was broken. All of my, you know why God will wait till all of your effort has been exhausted? You know why he'll do that? Because often we'll push, 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 push for things to happen in our ministry, in our lives, in our family, in our business. And we're pushing for it to happen. And it doesn't happen. It's because when the answer finally comes, when the miracle finally comes, he wants you to know who deserves the glory. Amen. That's right. That's right. So that when it comes, you go, you go, I had tried everything I knew to do with that. And he said, that's right. That's exactly where I want you because an impossible situation is the perfect setting for a miracle. If you're in an impossible situation, I got good news. That's the perfect setting for a miracle. You may be looking at it saying, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. He will make a way. And I found out that he made a way because I began to weep. And I said, Lord, I, all I want is you. All I want is your presence. All I want is, is everything that you have to offer me. Lord, I just want to experience the riches of Jesus. Yes. And I'll never forget the Holy Spirit began to speak to me in that moment. And he tells me, turn off the light. I turned off the light. I said, turn off the fan. It was buzzing. I turned off the fan. I said, close the Bible. I said, oh. 
Lord, are you sure? I closed the Bible. And he said, turn off the music. I said, surely you can't move without the music, Lord. And I turned off the music. And the Lord said to just look at him. See, we try so hard, don't we? The scripture says, be still and know that I am God. We want to be still and know our troubles. Be still and know everything that's going on. Be still and know that I am God. Stillness precedes revelation. Before you can know, you have to be still. And so I'm in that moment, and I remember just, just waiting on him. And all I did was imagine and meditate. You know, the scripture says on his word, I meditate day and night. Who's the word? It's Jesus. When you're thinking about Jesus, you're meditating on the word. And so I'm meditating on Jesus, just thinking about in whatever way he's revealed himself. If he's revealed himself as healer, think about what a wonderful healer he is. If he's revealed himself as savior, praise him for saving you. And so in that moment, I'm just thinking about Jesus in all the wonderful ways he's revealed himself to me. And the Holy Spirit took my, my revelation of him and brought it to reality. And in that moment, I felt like a gentle breeze, not physically, but I felt somewhat of what could have been described as, a, I don't know how to say it other than I sensed it in the spirit. And a gentle breeze moves through my room. And I became real calm. I became real still. And I remember feeling like warmth on me, electricity moving through me. And that transformed my life. I remember, I sensed them so real, I was like frozen. And I thought, if I open my eyes, I'm going to see him. I was afraid to move my hand because I thought, if I move my hand, I might feel it brush up against his robe. And I just stood there still, quiet. That's the key to spirit-led prayer. We're going to go into the four keys, and I'm, or the four realms, and I'm going to go over those very quickly. But that is the key. I wanted to spend some time on this. That is the key to spirit-empowered prayer. It's silence and stillness. Now, silence is the easy part, relatively speaking, compared to stillness. Silence is the putting away of outer distraction. It's turning your phone off. It's letting people know, you can't disturb me for the next 20 minutes, the next hour, the next two hours. I'm going to seek the Lord. That takes discipline. That takes human effort. That's our partnership with God. You have to block out the days. You know, there's times we go all day and the Holy Spirit's drawing us. Come pray, come pray, come pray. We say, later, Lord, later, Lord, later, Lord. And then we get into our prayer closet and we say, okay, Lord, I'm here. Nothing happens. And we wonder why. It's because you missed the appointment. Now, I'm not saying you cannot talk to God whenever you want, but there are certain appointments that he has for us when he, because he initiates everything. He draws us in. We can't draw ourselves in and we can't say, Lord, draw me in. If you're asking to be drawn, it's because he put that spiritual desire in your heart to be drawn. So if you're asking for it, when you sense your desire to move in, you're actually sensing his desire to draw you in because you're becoming one. And so silence is the putting away of outer distraction. Silence is that disciplined aspect of prayer. But stillness is the quieting of the soul. Stillness is when you go to pray and all that's assaulting your mind begins to attack you. What do you do when you go to pray and there's the inner chaos. Isn't it funny? That does, you don't notice that until you pray. All day you're fine. And the moment you begin to pray, things start running through your mind. Can I tell you something? It's not that that chaos shows up when you start praying. It's that you're quiet enough to recognize it. Oh, wow. A good measure of what goes on inside of you is how you feel when you're in silence. Because when you get into silence, you get to judge what's been in your heart all that time. Anyway, so I'm going to quickly now go over these keys. Number one, requesting. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7 says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, this aspect of prayer is what gets a bad rap because you often hear it said, you often hear it said, Oh, well, I want to ask God for something, but I'm afraid because I don't want to be hypocritical. I don't want to be materialistic. 
I know God wants to bless me. I know God wants to give me something, but, but I, I'm too afraid to ask. That, can I tell you something? That's a poverty mentality. Church, that's a poverty mentality, and it needs to be broken. God wants to bless you. Now, in our thinking, it's, well, what about those starving people in third world countries? Well, that's why God wants to bless you. So you can do something about it. You see, God doesn't, to bless you, God doesn't need to curse someone else. He's eternally supplied. And so he wants you to request. And I'm going to show you why. Remember, we talked about this problem with inner chaos. Did you know that the prayer request is actually God's way of removing that inner chaos from you? Look at this. Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7. Beginning of verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Okay? Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So some people say, if you're asking God for something, you can't possibly be thankful. This contradicts that. Because it's telling you to, while you're asking God for what you need, you're thanking him for what he has done. You can be requesting and grateful at the same time. Yes. Then verse 7 says, and we all quote this one, peace that passeth all understanding, right? But it says, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. When? Then. Then. When? Then. Church, when? Then. then. When is then? Now. It's talking about when you give him your prayer request, come to God, ask him for what you want, then the peace of God will fill your heart. When you enter to the realm of prayer request, what you're doing is you're collecting all of your needs, all of those things that trouble you, and you're handing them over to God. That inner chaos in you, you're taking it and leaving it in God's hands. So the prayer request is one of the keys to stillness of the, of the soul. When we give God the things that trouble us within us, when we give him those things that are on our mind, it frees us to be able to enter the deeper realms of prayer. Here's the problem, and this is why the prayer request is looked at negatively. Because when people pray and they unburden themselves with their earthly desires and their earthly concerns, they give it to God, they fill the peace, flood them, and then what do they do? They, they, they say, thank you, God, and they go on their way. God didn't give you the peace so that you can walk away. He gave you the peace to move closer. So the prayer request is number one. Number two is reverencing. John chapter 4, verse 23 says, But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. I was at a church, and I don't mean, if you're religious, I'm sorry, you're going to get offended. But I was at a church that had one of those angry drill sergeant worship leaders. <laughs> the ones who scold you if you're not doing exactly what they need you to do during different, different parts. Oh, don't you love the Lord? Oh, come on. You can lift your hand or you can yell and they say the same things. You can yell for a baseball game. You can yell for a football game, but you can't yell for Jesus. Right? They say those things. And so she's yelling at people. I'm going, oh my goodness. She's like really angry at this church. Like, like this is like, this is righteous indignation or she's got to repent. One of the two. And, and she's yelling at them. And, and I remember this, the atmosphere was very, it, was, it wasn't God. It was the flesh. It was very uncomfortable. And she says, come on, you got to get used to this because this is how it's going to be in heaven. I said, I sure hope not. <laughs> And so I, I recognize in that moment that you can't demand worship. Worship cannot be demanded. It's cultivated. It's only by the Holy Spirit. All true worship comes from revelation, not from information. Information makes you think. Revelation makes you worship. And when revelation comes from the Holy Spirit... It's not that you have to be coached into worshiping. It naturally overflows because of the revelation you've received. So he says true worshipers are going to worship me in spirit and church, not in truth, not by tradition, not by mandate, not by demands, not by structure, though structure has its place. But he is saying that true worship is going to overflow because of what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts. You know, the scripture talks about holy beings flying around the Father 24-7 saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. You often notice in the scripture that whenever someone cries holy, it's because the Lord has revealed himself. Do you realize that these beings for all of eternity 
are flying around him saying, holy, 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 that for all of eternity, each time they come full circle, they capture a new revelation of God. And it brings out a response. They have, they, people say, how can they worship for all of eternity? It's because for all of eternity, they're receiving revelation. Worship moves the shift. It takes shift from your needs to focusing on Jesus. There's a song. Now, to me, it's old. I apologize if, it's, if, it's, if it was one of the new ones back in your uh, day for worship. But turn your eyes upon Jesus. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's poetic, it's beautiful, it's true. When you're looking at Jesus, the light of his face is so brilliant that everything else goes dim. So the prayer request removes the inner chaos, allows you to focus on the revelation which moves you into worship. Much easier than the way I was doing it. And then I won't spend too much time on this one because I, I want more time for the last one here. The, thir the third one is resisting. This is spiritual warfare. Now, many of you know about spiritual warfare. But I will say this. Anything that sin and the devil does in this earth can be undone through prayer. When you're praying in the spirit, when you enter that realm of intercessory, you become an agent of God's dominion and authority in the earth. And you, when you speak, you may be over here, but someone over there can receive. You know, the thing about prayer is it's impossible to accomplish nothing in prayer. For every moment you are praying, you are growing. For every moment you are praying, you are accomplishing something, whether you see it immediately or not. We'll be praying for somebody and we talk to them and they seem so resistant to the gospel. The truth is, despite the facade that they place before your eyes, because of the faith that you have, you can know with certainty that when you're warring for somebody's soul, when you're warring for a situation, that you are making impact. That's spiritual warfare. John chapter 6, Jesus is talking in verse 53. Remember, the fourth one is reading. I'm going to show you something very powerful that happens when you're reading the word. Because it's not just reading a book. It's not a biography. You're experiencing a person. He is the word. And Jesus himself says that this is a supernatural thing. I know the binding and the pages and the ink are of our earth, but this is a supernatural experience every time you open the Bible. Okay, so verse 53, this is Jesus talking. Is this blessing you? Yes. Okay, this is Jesus talking. I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise the person at the last day. What's he talking about in the last day? Talking about the resurrection. Before that, he says, I'm the bread that comes down. What is that? That's the incarnation. When he comes down to earth, that is the incarnation. Say it with me, the incarnation. incarnation. When the flesh and the blood are mentioned, that is his crucifixion. So he's already painting a picture here. He's talking about a journey. And we go on a similar journey. I won't have time to get into that. But he goes from incarnation to crucifixion. The incarnation is when the Holy Spirit took the unknowable God as far as can be comprehended by the human mind. When he took the limitless God, when he took the eternal God, the incomprehensible God, and made him a man, and Jesus was everything of God in the flesh. That, I can't even comprehend that. But when you see Jesus, you see the Father. Incarnation, God becoming man, spirit becoming flesh, carn, meat, carnivore, same thing. Incarnation. Incarnation, crucifixion. Then he says, I live because of the living Father who sent me in the same way. Anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. What's he talking about there? That's the very next breath. He's talking about his resurrection. So, Incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection. Now watch this. He goes straight into the other one. And Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. They're, they're like, what is he talking about? Because none of this has happened yet. He says, does this offend you? Then what will you say or think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? Are you seeing it? Incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. Now this is what... This is where it really takes a, a strange turn. So he's talking about this process, okay? 
And I'm reading this, and I'm going, okay, this is good. And then he makes this sudden switch, just like that. And he says, the Spirit alone gives life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words, the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Okay, there's a lot here. Incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. What is this he's talking about? You know, Jesus said, I can't send the Holy Spirit until I go to my Father. Now, why is that? I wondered that. Why is it, Lord, you had to go up before he could come down? And the Holy Spirit, by the way, is literally down to earth, which is why he can work with us so well. I said, Lord, why is that? Well, when I look at my iPad, I got a lot of sermons on here. But if I were to ever misplace my iPad, my sermons, my pictures, my audio, they'd all be gone. But there's something amazing about my iPad. There's something amazing about your phone that the information you have gets stored in what we call a cloud. Jesus ascended on a cloud. The word becomes flesh, crucified, resurrection, ascension, translation. Now the Lord is spirit. Why does it say now? Because then it wasn't. But now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Adam was one thing, but Christ, the scripture says, became a life-giving spirit. This is his translation. What am I saying to you? I'm saying just as my information, because you know, you think about Jesus and all he had to touch and all he had to do. Think just for example, when Jairus' daughter was dying and they come for the master and he goes to Jairus and on his way there, this woman with the issue of blood stops him in the middle of the tracks. I'll tell you, if I was Jairus, I'd be angry and furious with this woman who stopped Jesus. He's on his way to rescue my daughter and you stop him? Can't you, you waited 12 years. Can't you wait a little longer? That's what I would have thought. Jesus was somewhat limited in a physical body. But when he ascended, he became the life-giving spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus on the cloud. How then does Christ become one with you? The very words I speak are spirit and life. When you read the word, the Holy Spirit takes from the cloud a download and puts it in you. When you read the word, Christ becomes incarnate in you. So Christians say, I don't believe in reincarnation. Yes, you do. Christ is reincarnated in you. So then prayer is not an upload, it's a download. You are Adam 2.0. You got a software upgrade. And we experience that download when we read the word. Did that bless you? Okay. Do you desire to know God in a deeper and more intimate way? Do you want your soul to be set ablaze with passionate love for Him? Do you want to walk in the fullness of all that He has created for you? Are you ready to receive your breakthrough, your miracle, your healing? David Hernandez wants to help you burn with God's glory and supernatural power. Call now and get David Diga Hernandez's powerful brand new book, Carriers of the Glory, Becoming a Friend of the Holy Spirit, plus his four-part audio CD teaching, Discover Your Identity identity as a carrier of God's glory. Yours for a donation of $39. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9403. David Diga Hernandez's powerful brand new book, Carriers of the Glory, will acquaint you with the mysterious third person of the Holy Trinity. You will understand the Holy Spirit's purpose and nature. Learn how to avoid the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is an unpardonable sin. Begin to operate in the spiritual gifts. Learn how to draw closer to the Holy Spirit. Become a carrier of God's Spirit and experience the supernatural power of God in your life. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the presence of God becomes one with you. And everywhere you go, you become an atmosphere of heaven. When you walk into rooms, 
the atmosphere changes. When you walk in, sickness goes out. When you come in, demons go out. And when you pray, you shake heaven and earth. You will also receive this four-part audio CD teaching, Discover Your Identity as a Carrier of God's Glory. Through this power-packed teaching series, you will learn five simple keys that you can activate immediately to become a close friend of the Holy Spirit. Enter into four realms of prayer that will help you receive divine favor, provision, healing, and protection. Receive the answers to the most asked questions concerning how to walk in God's glory and obtain His supernatural power and authority. David includes eight anointed prayers that will help you experience the presence of the Holy Spirit right away. David is going to pray all the facets of glory and the Holy Spirit upon you. I can't wait for you to be normal. Normal is defined by the Bible. God wants your friendship and the Holy Spirit is going to be such a friend that he's going, I like David's word, vivify. He is going to make Jesus more real to you than ever in your life. Get ready to burn with God's glory and supernatural power. Don't miss out on getting David Diga Hernandez's powerful brand new book, Carriers of the Glory, Becoming a Friend of the Holy Spirit, plus his four-part audio CD teaching, Discover Your Identity as a Carrier of God's Glory, yours for a donation of $39. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9403. Call or you can send your check to Sid Roth. It's Supernatural, P.O. Box 39222, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28278. Please specify offer number 9403 or log on to SidRoth.org. Call or write today.